Good morning. We started a new series last week in the season of Advent called Uncommon on the book of Ruth. And this is a tremendous story. This little four chapter uh, book that we have in between the book of Judges and the book of 1 Samuel. And last week, we traveled with Naomi down into the depths of despair. She is bereaved of husbands, of her husband and sons. And she returns to Bethlehem, having been transformed from pleasant to bitter, from full to empty. Naomi is grieved, and understandably so. At the same time, as readers of this story, we have a little bit of reason to quibble with her assessment as being empty. In fact, the final verse of chapter 1 gives us two reasons for hope at this point in the story. And I do invite you to open up your Bibles to Ruth Chapter 2 is where we'll be, but we'll begin with the last verse of chapter 1. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. The first little glimmer for hope is that Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, is actually with Naomi. She is not entirely alone And we have seen that this is like a lightning bolt at night. It's a stroke of bright light upon an otherwise dark canvas. Ruth is really with her. Till death do us part, kind of with her. And this uncommon commitment gives us reason to hope as we look at this story further. Second, the final words of that last verse. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. The famine is over. There's grain in the fields to be harvested, a possibility for sustenance. They arrived in Bethlehem at just the right time. We think probably in, in, this, in the month of April. And will these, the question is, will these circumstances prove to be beneficial for these two women who are vulnerable and bereaved? And that's the question that we take with us into the second chapter, which begins with a note from the narrator. Look with me at verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. How will this relative Boaz factor into this story of these bereaved women? He's named a worthy man, wealth of significance, of valor, perhaps even of military might. It's often used, this word, in the Old Testament. Will he too play a shaping role in the future of these women and for Elimelech's diminishing family? We actually don't have to wait long to see because chapter two, or again our text today, is the account of Ruth's introduction to Boaz in his field. And what we'll find in this story today is the mark of God's favor, his uncommon favor expressed through this man Boaz to Ruth. It is a beautiful next step in this little intriguing story. Let me begin by returning to something that I said last week that I actually want to qualify this week. It's been nagging at me since I spoke it in the sermon last week. I don't know if anyone else noticed. None of you reached out to me about it. But it has been nagging at me. I said, I I was making the point that God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong and that God often, often works through weakness to demonstrate his unique source of uh, him being the unique source of abundant power and I said this I said and what were Ruth and Naomi if not weak and there's a sense in which that is of course true I meant by saying weak to emphasize their situation It, it is a situational weakness if you will a weakness that comes upon them because they are unmarried women in a society that makes them particularly vulnerable and threatened because of that status. It's a kind of weakness that would be akin to the situational weakness of a refugee in today's world. Refugees coming out of Afghanistan, they often flee their homeland in a hurry with barely anything but the clothes on their back, and they arrive in foreign lands dependent and vulnerable in need of favor and kindness from another. But this kind of situational weakness, I just wanted to clarify, is not to be confused with a weakness of character or resolve in the case of refugees or in the case of Ruth and Naomi. In fact, these two women respond to their desperate situation with creativity, with courage, 
with boldness and faith and resolve in ways that God blesses deeply and even uses in his redemptive purposes. And in chapter 2 in particular, we see that this, this woman, this foreigner, Ruth the Moabite, this stranger in a strange land, land, has tremendous strength and courage as she sets out to provide for her mother-in-law and herself. Ruth, that is to say, is a woman of strength to be emulated by the people of God. She's a woman that we particularly want our daughters, and I have three of them, and trust they're listening. Two of them are here right now. We want our daughters to look up to this woman, to her selflessness, to her faith, to her courage and her strength. She, has, she may be vulnerable. She may have fallen on hard times. That's out of her hands. But Ruth's heart and faith, by the grace of God, are strong. And she's a wonderful example of living faithfully before the Lord. Yet at the same time, and we see her strength and courage come through in this chapter, the focus of this chapter is on this man introduced in verse 1, whose name is Boaz, and his uncommon favor to Ruth. And what I would like to do as we study this text is to think about this uncommon favor, think about its context, or maybe even it might be better to say its source, its extent, and then its result. So its context or source, its extent, and its result. So look with me back at the text, verse 2 of chapter 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she, that is Naomi, said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Ruth receives this uncommon favor in the field of Boaz. But we need to understand, and this is so important, that it is the Lord himself. We need to step back with a wide-angle lens and get a fuller view of the scene to see just how central it is God himself who is the source and the context of this blessing that she's about to receive. So think with me for a moment. Let's go back to verse 6 of chapter 1. What happens in verse 6? For in the, she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So the Lord had taken away the famine. The Lord had created the context of food again in, in Naomi's homeland that led her to make the decision to go back to Bethlehem. And then Ruth, of course, chose to go with her. But let's remember that it's God who put the barley in the fields. I'm going to give you, I don't normally give you seven points under one point. So just stay with me. That was just one under the first one. We'll see if we can stay together. Second, it was the work of God in Ruth's heart that led her to convert to him, the God of Israel, and to do the extraordinary, not the ordinary thing that Orpah did when she went back to Moab, but the extraordinary Hesed action that Ruth did to stick to her mother-in-law, to cling to her, to say, where you go, I will, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Your God, your people, my people, your God, my God. This is something that God does in Ruth that puts her in Bethlehem with Naomi in this moment eager to provide now for her mother-in-law by being willing to go out and do the gleaning, a stranger in a strange land. Third, and this is more mysterious, as Naomi declares in chapter 1, verses 13 and 20 through 21, it was the Lord who was behind Naomi's suffering, taking her and Ruth to this place of desperation and dependence. Now, I should say we are at times so reticent to attribute anything difficult to the hand of God, that I fear we diminish his providence. Naomi does not suffer from the same problem. There are depths to plunge here, no doubt, from her example. But for today, I'll just say that God's ways are far beyond our ways. And while we might shake our fist at him, we must also recognize that we cannot fully understand his ways. But we know that he is never surprised by what we walk through in our lives in terms of suffering. And we know that it is never wasted. Think of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal glory beyond all comparison. Honestly, if we just keep it real for a moment, how many of you in this room right now could testify that you have grown most deeply in your faith through the refining fire of suffering? that God has used that in your life. Perhaps we would never have wanted that, but God has used it so deeply 
to deepen our attachment to him, our dependence upon him, even our joy in his abundant provision. In Naomi's case, out of this difficulty and bitterness and relative emptiness, God is preparing something far greater. Fourth, stay with me, God's laws enable the poor to be in the field of the wealthy. That is to say that without God's gracious provision in his law, his beautiful, holy, and good, and perfect law, Ruth could never have found herself in Boaz's field. The gleaning laws are a beautiful picture of the heart of God in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19, 9, and 10, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. That is, you shall not squeeze every last penny of profit out of your business or your assets. But you shall leave some of the proceeds, some of the bounty for the poor and the vulnerable. These laws ensured, however, and I think this is an important point in Old Testament law, that the poor could work for themselves on the land of the wealthy, maintaining their dignity and their, their engagement as in their agency in providing for themselves. Yet, let us not think of this with a, a rosy colored, that this is some kind of rosy colored picture. As one commentator has noted, this, this idea of gleaning was still really hard going. This wasn't easy. He compared it to actually trying to make a living on recycling aluminum cans. Not an easy thing to do, but maybe you'd get just enough to get by. Still, it was a window of God's graciousness and of, the, of, the, of his expected graciousness of his people toward those who had fallen on hard times. And it was that law that allowed Ruth to be in this field on this day. Fifth, Ruth's God-given courageous strength, faith, and love Put her here. And again, these are God's gifts to Ruth. To go and glean in the fields as an unmarried woman was not without its danger. That is clear from the way that Boaz tells his young men not to touch Ruth in verse 9. That likely means, it does literally mean to touch, but most likely it's probably something like to strike or harass or to take advantage of. And he says something similar again in verse 16 when he tells his workers not to rebuke her. There were clearly dangers for women in the gleaning business. It wasn't some kind of well-regulated industry. And this chapter communicates those dangers. And there are even greater dangers when you're a foreigner with no status in the land at all, no family to really cling to. You're lower than the hired workers. You're lower than the other gleaners from Israel who are out in the fields. You're lower, of course, than the landowners. So Ruth, Ruth sets out that morning to glean, and she, as she says in verse 2, after him in whose sight I shall find favor, knowing very well that this favor is not guaranteed, that a, hard, a day of hardship and abuse could await her. But this is where Ruth's character just shines so brilliantly, her tremendous commitment to Naomi, her hesed love toward her mother-in-law, urges her to courageously go on and go forward that she might provide for her mother-in-law. Six, and this is where we get back into the text a little more specifically, our text. Look at verse three with me. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. She just so happened. The literal rendering of this phrase is her chance chanced upon. Or we might put it as luck would have it. And the narrator we don't know, again, if this is a man or a woman writing this, this story, but the narrator is saying with loud sirens, God is at work here. God is moving in these seemingly ha uh, chance circumstances. This is not chance at all. It's the sovereign providential hand of God that brings this woman, this foreigner, this vulnerable widow into the field of this man, this noble man. She's there because God has put her there. And then we read in verse 4, and behold... Another kind of just then. Imagine that. Boaz walks up into his field. It's another sign of divine providence. Bringing about the meeting of this woman and this man in this field on this day. In this moment. God's fingerprints are all over Ruth's situation and circumstances. 
And we are left with this question, would this preeminent insider who has status, he's a man, he's wealthy, he's a, a, a landowner, he's a noble uh, man of character, would it change this preeminent outsider's situation? This woman, this widow, this barren woman, this foreigner. You couldn't get farther apart in terms of status. God brings them together. And we, the reader, are left with these questions. And then now I'm at the seventh and final of these seven points saying that this is the Lord who provides, is the source and the context for this blessing. Because what does Boaz say in verse 4? This is amazing, by the way. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. This field is marked by the presence of the God of Israel, Yahweh, the Lord. And he is invoked here in their greeting. And probably this greeting at harvest time implies something implicit. May he prosper and bless your work at harvest time, O workers. Think about the working environment that this man has created. An environment where the presence of God is known, invoked, lived before and in front of. And infuses all the dealings of his field with a sense of being in the presence of the Lord. Boaz is a righteous man who brings the presence of God into his workplace and creates conditions for employment among even the gleaners that are marked by God's character. No, it is the Lord who is the source and the context of this blessing, of this favor. God's gracious but mysterious providence is the context of the uncommon favor that Ruth and by extension Naomi is about to experience. His hand is all over this and we can't in our own lives, let's just bring this to the present, in our, in our own lives, we can't look at the blessings, the favor in our own lives, can we? Without understanding that they've happened in the context of the living God. The God who has given us the minds in our, in our, on, our, on our shoulders, the bodies that we have, the breath that we breathe, the privileges that we have enjoyed. We've just celebrated Thanksgiving a week and a half ago and we've said that we are thankful and isn't this a time to honor God for all that we enjoy? Thankfulness is fully and finally expressed to the God from whom every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Let me just ask, can you see the favor in your life as the result of the hand of God. Maybe you're in a situation where you have a hard time seeing any favor, but there is favor there and that this is a reflection of his kindness, of his taking an interest in you. And that kindness and interest will in fact endure forever. So long as God is our context and he is the context here for Ruth, then our lot will be favor and blessing. Let's move to the second point, the extent of the blessing. Obviously, we've said the Lord has led Ruth to this moment, to this field, and he's led her here to show her uncommon favor through Boaz, this amazing man. It is extravagant, it is lavish, it is overwhelming. Let's watch it unfold a little bit before us in the narrative. In verse five, Boaz says to his young, the young man in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And then he finds out that the young woman is the one who has been the talk of the town for the past few days, ever since she and her mother-in-law returned back from Moab. The young Moabite woman, he replies, who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. It's interesting that Ruth's foreign status features regularly in this chapter, but here the foreman puts it on his lips twice. The, 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 the Moabite who's come back from Moab. It's as if he's saying, yeah, she's a real foreigner, Boaz. Not, nothing to see here. She doesn't have any status with us. She's been at work gleaning, but now she's maybe taking a short rest. Verse seven is notoriously difficult to translate. No one really knows exactly what to do with it. I think what the ESV does here is, is helpful. She says, please let, he tells Boaz that she's made a request. Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she's continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. This is actually an insight into Ruth's boldness. She's a foreigner, remember? A first time gleaner in Israel. She asked for permission to glean among the sheaves after the reapers. This would be in a place where gleaners were not typically allowed. Typically in the harvest season, the male workers would go through the field first and they would, they would cut off the stalks. 
and lay them down. And then the female hired servants would come through the field and they would bundle them in sheaves and tie them together and then carry them off to the threshing floor where they'd be ground or beat and the, the husks would be separated from the grain and they would create the, they would take the grain. And then only after the sheaves had been removed from the field would the gleaners be allowed to come into the field and they could pick up the scraps. But here's Ruth. Out of her deep love for Naomi, out of her deep desire to provide and to follow through on her commitment to her mother-in-law, pushing the limits of the law here, pushing to the spirit of the law, the laws of gleaning seem to imply really that there is a responsibility to care for the poor. And Ruth is challenging Boaz to come out and see the full extent of this by giving her permission to do something audacious. Would he respond? Would he take this moment as a man of stature to teach her the finer points of the law, to put her back in her place, to resist this kind of forward advance? And we get verse 8. These are amazing words. The first time that Boaz speaks to Ruth. Now listen, my daughter. Do not go and glean, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Imagine Ruth in this moment. Honestly, she has no idea whose field she's in. She's vulnerable and exposed. She's made an audacious request. She knows that. And his words to her are what? Listen, my daughter, my daughter. The same words that Naomi had used of Ruth back in verse one or two, my daughter. Imagine the sense of warmth that would just start to go through every cell of her body when he said those words. This might be the day that my fortune changes. This man might treat me as I long to be treated. He might actually see me as a young woman trying to make ends meet for my mother-in-law, having stepped out in faith to serve a God that I didn't know that well, but I've committed my life to. He might actually be the source of something good in a world of great darkness. Lord, could this be the moment? My daughter... This term that Boaz uses certainly acknowledges an age difference between the two. He was probably a contemporary of Naomi's. But it also seems to be very clearly a term through which Boaz is trying to bridge the social gap between a wealthy male landowner and Israelite and a lowly foreign Moabite woman, my daughter. And then see what he says to her. He tells her to not go to another field, stay in my field, to keep close to his young women, that is his hired workers. He calls for her protection from the young men and then going further, he tells her to drink from the water that the young men had drawn. In this culture, foreigners drew water for Israelites, women drew water for men. Boaz tells this young woman to drink water drawn from Israelite men. This was absolutely revolutionary favor that he was signaling to her in short Boaz has transformed in these two verses Ruth's situation from a vulnerable outsider to a privileged insider he's taking a foreigner and making her a part of his own community of his own kind of uh Homestead, giving her a place among his hired workers where, where she can glean with good prospects and with protection from the landowner himself and with provision of water so that she doesn't have to waste time going back to the well to draw water in the heat of the day. She can keep gleaning uninterrupted. And so Ruth, overwhelmed at the kindness, overwhelmed at the favor, falls down on her face, we read in verse 10, bowing to the ground and says to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Why should you see me? I almost think of Hagar back in Genesis 16. Do you remember after Abram and Sarah had, had used her and sent her out? And Who should care about her? And God sees her. 
She names him the Lord who sees, or the Lord sees me. Why have you noticed me, Ruth says. Why me, the lowest of the low, this foreign woman? Why have you noticed me? And then Boaz responds to her being overwhelmed. Explains the reasons why he's begun to treat her like one of his own family. Why he's changed her status from outsider to insider. And he says in in verse 11, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. Ruth, I've heard about you. I've heard about your devotion to our God. I've heard about your devotion to your mother-in-law and to Elimelech's family. I've heard that you've come back. And in many ways, I'm just giving to you that which the Lord will give to you because of your fidelity and faithfulness to him. Boaz knows of her hesed to Naomi. And so he offers her hesed in return. And then he says this in verse 12, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What an image they are used throughout the scriptures of the bird that covers the little babies under its wings to shelter them from the dangers. Ruth, you've come to take refuge under the God of Israel and I'm now extending that refuge to you as a noble and worthy man in Israel. Ruth is overwhelmed again. Verse 13, I've found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. I'm even lower, she says. And look, if all of this, this is extreme and extravagant favor, and all of this wasn't enough, look what happens in verses 14 and 15. Now Boaz invites her to his table. Eating in our day means something, but in that day it meant so much more. He invited this foreign woman, this lowest of the low, to come and eat with him, to have a meal with him. At mealtime, Boaz said, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. This is verse 14. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied. And had some left over. Surely you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup, what? Overflows. She ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. And then it gets even more extravagant in verse 15. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean, even among the sheaves. Let her do what she requests. Let her have that audacious request that she can go in among the workers, the hired workers, and begin to gather barley among the sheaves. And do not reproach her, he says. And then he even goes further in verse, it's like crazy. He goes further in verse 16. And he pulls out some of the bundles for her. He says, pull out some of the bundles for her. And leave it to her for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Basically put a lavish feast in front of her and let her go and pick up the grain. Because I want to provide for her. I want to lavish favor upon her. I want her to have enough. More than enough. This is favor unheard of. Favor, surprising favor, favor that goes beyond what anyone would expect. Boaz takes Ruth's challenge to do more and does even more. He, ten, he, he multiplies it by a factor of 10. And so what are the results as we come to the third part of our, of our time together? We've seen first there's a change of status, right? A change of status from outsider to insider. That's been obvious in what we've said up to this point. But let's just focus in on a few more of the results of this uncommon favor. It changes her status, and that then brings a comfort in her grief. I read it already, but go back to verse 13. I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me. That's what a woman in grief says. That's what a woman who's afraid says. She lost her husband. She'd been barren for 10 years. She was in a foreign land. You have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant. Her troubled spirit was ministered to by this righteous man that had no business dealing with her. So she's comforted in her grief. It leads to an abundance of provision. If we continue on, it says she gleaned in the field, verse 17, until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. This was a massive amount of barley. We don't carry a lot of barley around these days, but this was a lot of barley. It's about 30 pounds of barley. The average hired worker in that 
in that era would have been expected to glean about a, a pound and a half to two pounds of barley. She's got 30 pounds of barley that she wraps in her shawl and carries home. An ephah of barley. This is abundant provision. This is my cup overflows. This is, this is Joseph stacking the, the, the riches of Egypt in the backpacks of his brothers that they go home with overflowing blessing. This is Israel coming out of, out of Egypt, having plundered the Egyptians and been given all that they had asked for. This is abundant overflow from this uncommon favor. There's then a renewed faith. She carries it into the city, returning to anxious Naomi, who's overwhelmed when she sees what Ruth has brought back. Verse 19, where did you glean today and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And Ruth responds, and this is like the drum roll in the, in the narrative. The, man, the man's name with whom I worked today is Boaz. Imagine Naomi, Boaz? Boaz? She's overwhelmed by the leftovers from the meal. She's been able to eat a, a meal even that night. She's overwhelmed by the, the pounds of barley. And then she hears the name Boaz. Oh God, you must be at work in greater ways than we could ever imagine. You must see the downtrodden and the widow and the heartbroken and the poor. You must be a God of Hesed love. You must be a God who pours out kindness upon his people. Boaz? She goes on to explain to Ruth the significance of that name. And we'll explore this more in the weeks to come. But she says to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness, whose hesed has not forsaken the living or the dead. The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. We won't get into it in full right now, but this means longer term security. One of our redeemers means, in short, that he is someone in the clan, in the family, a relative who has the right, perhaps even the responsibility, but surely the right to intervene in the situation of those in his family who have fallen on hard times and who could change our circumstances and our outcomes for generations to come. This is Boaz. You've ended up in the field of Boaz. Oh, it must have been God. Could it have been anyone else to work such great great favor upon these two women long ago and so they continue and she says and Ruth tells her more besides he said to me you shall keep close to my young men until they've finished all my harvest and so Naomi says to Ruth her daughter-in-law it is good my daughter that you go out with his young woman women lest in another field you be assaulted so Ruth kept close to the young women of Boaz gleaning until the end of barley of the barley and wheat harvest and she lived with her mother-in-law this Uncommon favor leads to long-term security in the present, but we will begin to see as we end up in chapters 3 and 4 in a much longer-term way. It's astonishing. Of course, the uncommon favor of Boaz reminds us of the uncommon favor of another righteous man who was noble in character, who had tremendous status, who had unbelievable wealth, and endless power. And the uncommon favor of Boaz reminds us, of course, of the uncommon favor of Jesus upon foreigners like Ruth, like you, and like me. People at the lowest of the low. People without any real future and hope. People upon whom hard, the hard times of sin had come. This one, Jesus, who is the preeminent insider, the one who has divine status, comes to us, we who were once far off, to give us favor, an uncommon favor. And he changes our status from rebellious sinners to cherished brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ says to you, my daughter, my son, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. He's changed our status from sinners to children, from outsiders to insiders, from lower than a servant to members of the household, from those in unpayable debt to those who are co-heirs with Christ of the new creation. He comforts us in our grief 
the grief that we all feel and the burdens of sin and shame and guilt that every one of us knows to the depth and to the core in our own lives, Jesus speaks words of comfort. Come to me, all you who weary and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. Oh, if you would just ask me, I would give you a cup of living water that if you would drink from it, you would never thirst again. He invites us to his table of abundant provision. It is not just roasted grain and barley, but it is the bread of life and the living water. It is the person of Jesus himself to feed us, to invite us to his table, to be nourished and strengthened on an abundant, never-ending supply of power and grace and strength. It is a deeply renewed faith. It is by grace you have been saved, Paul says, through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. His un unspeakable favor evokes a response of faith for which you and I can take no responsibility. But like Naomi's faith is restored, she's praising Yahweh at the end of this chapter where she's cursing him at the end of chapter one. So too, by his uncommon favor, our faith is restored. And there is, you better believe it, as there was for Ruth, a long-term security from this change of status. There is a long-term change for you and me that the one who called us is faithful and he will do it. He will be sure to complete the good work that he has begun in you. And we look forward to that day when he will come again and make all things new and wipe away every tear from our eye. And there will be no more sickness and no more crying and no more death and no more pain. No more Ruths and Naomi's in the depths of despair. Or maybe that's you or me today in the depths of, of despair because he will be faithful. His uncommon favor is unspeakable, it's unmatchable, it's praiseworthy, it's glorious. It evokes the deepest response of praise that has inspired the greatest and richest works of art and beauty and poetry and song and music for the last 2,000 years because he is worthy, because his favor is so amazing, and because we are not worthy. We were the foreigner, vulnerable, exposed, and he showed us favor. An uncommon favor. Look, whatever your circumstances are this morning, I want to say this to you. Do not think that his favor has ceased. Remember what Paul asks, he who did not spare his own son, how will he not graciously give us all things? He is still giving you himself. Whatever your circumstances may be, Paul asks that question in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trial and difficulty. And our situation, whatever it may be this morning, is not beyond him. Just like Ruth's and Naomi's situation was not beyond him. Can we see the favor that we found in Jesus? Could it be that our present circumstances will be used by God to bring greater blessing? And if that blessing doesn't look like a resolution to our problems or the removal of our burdens in the flesh, then could it be that he is using this suffering to refine us in the refiner's fire that we might be whole with greater with greater certainty and assurance and comfort and perhaps even joy and dependence, the genuine treasure that he's already given us in his son. Maybe that's what he's doing even now. And that is a form of blessing. But we know, this is Advent, remember, we're waiting for him to return. We know that one day he will come back. And the spiritual blessings, we enjoy every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. The spiritual blessings will be transformed into the physical realm for all of us in Christ. And there will be feasting to no end and singing to no end and joy to no end because of God's great hesed. More than Ruth, we are recipients of an uncommon favor, brothers and sisters, not of Boaz, but of the greater Boaz, Jesus. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we worship you and praise you who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead, your hesed. For anyone who feels like Ruth this morning when she walked out of the door to go glean, how I pray, oh God, by your special grace that you would give them a, a reassurance of your comfort and of your favor. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Lord, you have pardoned us, the condemned, and set us free. We glory in you this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.